I'll invite you to open your Bible to our main scripture for today. It's Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Today we're looking at what Jesus said about this event that he called the Great Tribulation. It's this very special event that we're told to look for that's going to be harder than anything in history, any, any trouble, any, any affliction, any tribulation that's ever happened before, and more so than anything that would ever come after. This is this time of great unrest, of great affliction, that's, that's specifically going to happen to God's people in this world. It's going to be an affliction that happens to people all over the world, but specifically we're going to look at it in the way that God's people experience this thing that Jesus tells us to look for. Tribulation is an interesting word. You don't hear it used every day in conversation. Unless it's usually used in relation to what the Bible says about what Jesus is talking about here in our scripture today. Tribulation, it means trouble or affliction. So the great tribulation could be said as the great affliction or the time of great trouble. So think about that as, as we read these things. The time of great trouble. Greater trouble than there's ever been before or ever will be. Jesus describes this event in our scripture today as being worse than any other thing that's ever happened before and worse than anything that happens after that. And it's a trouble like the world has never seen before. It's a worse event. Think about all the terrible things that have ever happened in history. And this is worse than that. This is harder than that. We think about those horrors and hard times that people have had to suffer throughout history. The world wars, the famines, the genocides, and the persecution. All these terrible things that have happened throughout history. The world has seen horrible things happen. People do terrible things to each other. But whatever we can point at, and we think, well, this is the worst of it. You look at the, these things that happened during maybe a world war, and you say, oh, well, this is as bad as it's ever been before. You look at the things that are happening in different parts of the world where people are just genociding each other and they're starving each other. There's these famines, these horrible things happening. And we would say, oh, no, no, th this is as bad as it's ever going to get. Nothing's ever been that bad before. Well, what Jesus is talking about here is worse than that by a long shot. It's much worse than that. The Bible shows us how hard times and afflictions can be a blessing to God's people. So when we look at hard times, we see it different than the unsaved do. We have a special perspective on how these things look because of the way that God has given us his grace and changed our hearts and given us a certain hope. We have a different kind of perseverance because we meet these challenges knowing that God uses all these things for our good. When a born-again Christian goes through hard times, we draw near to the Lord. Affliction is like a mirror that God holds up to people that shows them who they really are. We can see ourselves in the light of the truth. And we can see what it is we put our faith in by the way that we meet these challenges of these afflictions that, that God puts in front of us. Whether it's sickness or disease or pain or hardship or just stress and heartbreak, whatever it is, the way that we respond to these hard times in our lives shows us who we are, but especially shows us what we put our faith in. When the unsaved go through hard times, they turn from God and they seek their comfort in the world. But when a born-again, saved Christian, a new creature in Christ, goes through hard times, we draw near to the Lord. We have a special response. And you can see your faith by the way that you meet these, these challenges. One example of that difference between turning towards the Lord or turning away from the Lord, how you can kind of test your faith in this way, is Romans 2. Where the Apostle Paul says the unsaved meet those tribulations in their lives with distress. He says, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of a man who does evil. And now he's saying those people who aren't saved, when they go through hard times, they stress over it. They, they have distress because they don't have this comfort, this hope that we have. And we compare what he says there in Romans 2 to, the, to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, where he shows us the way a Christian is going to respond to hardship and tribulations. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. We rejoice in our tribulations, 
knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us we didn't earn it it was given to us so we meet these challenges with hope with trust and with endurance we persevere through these things so on one hand you see trouble and affliction causing distress in the hearts of the unsaved that they, they, they worry about these things and they think that they get their comfort elsewhere in the world or they're looking for their strength inside themselves and on the other hand a saved new creature in christ a born-again christian will have hope in tribulations because we trust the lord god in these things these are your two different responses and you can see who you are by the way that you meet these challenges we will, will persevere through hard times because we trust the Lord God in these things. And we have this awareness that God means even the hard parts of our life. With that, that sickness, that old age, that death, the, the persecution, the affliction, whatever it is, God means these things for our good. And he uses it to sanctify us, to draw us close to him. And if we meet these challenges and experience these things with that awareness, with that understanding, then whatever happens, we receive it like a gift. And that's something that marks you as a Christian. You know a tree by its fruit. You can see that in the way that you respond to these things. We know that whatever it is, God's going to use it. And we have hope in that because that hope is in Christ. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And we overcome the world through Jesus Christ. He says, in me you have peace. Well, that's true. And the way that you meet the challenges of your life shows you where you are because you're either in Christ or you're not. And the way that you, you can tell is by how you meet these challenges. There are certain ways that you can see your faith. If you're in Christ, you have peace. If you're not in Christ, then you have distress. And you can see the state of somebody's heart by how they respond to affliction. And here in our main scripture for today, we see Jesus telling us to watch for this event that he calls the great tribulation, the great affliction, this great trouble that we're told to look out for. He says it's going to be worse than any other part of history, and that's scary. But as Christians, we rejoice in tribulations. That's what Paul was saying. We see that challenge coming, and we go, I don't want to go through that. But we know that if we do, then God's going to use that to pull us closer to him. It's going to sanctify us and grow us into the person that he's called us to be. And the bigger the, the trouble, the bigger the tribulation, the more we're afflicted or persecuted, the more he's going to grow us. So we look at it and we go, oh, that's going to be hard. That's going to be painful. I trust God in this. I know that God has a purpose and a plan for all these things. We know that tribulation brings perseverance and we'll be able to see it. And the way that we persevere is going to show our character. It's going to allow us to test our faith. It lets us see what we put our faith in. And there's a peace in the way that you trust the Lord. Or put our trust in ourselves and go, I have to do this thing. Or we trust that God has a purpose and a plan for all these things, even the scary parts, and say, okay, God, whatever you're doing, I'm in. Let's do this. I trust the Lord God in this thing. Do we see ourselves drawing near to the Lord for comfort and strength? Or do we turn away from him? And the way that we respond to that, if we have hope or if we have distress, it's going to show us who we are. And for those people that Jesus is talking about here, that he says will endure. It's in this context that we look at what Jesus says about the great tribulation and we read our main scripture for today. It's Matthew 24, verses 15 to 28. But before we read it, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for these Bibles you've put in our hands. We pray that as we open them up and we read them, that the way that, that we search for you in your word, that you would reveal the truth to us, that you would give us an understanding of these things. And if we misunderstand any of it, Father, we pray that you would correct us. We pray that you would show us what it is you want us to see, that you would grow us into the people we're supposed to be, and that you would make us bold in the way that we go out and to live our lives as your people, that you, that you would live through, that you would shine through, that you would love through as we go into our lives and, and talk to these people you put in front of us. We pray that you make us bold in the way that we share this hope that you've given us. We know that we can't make other people understand the truth, but we know that we, we're supposed to proclaim the truth, that we're supposed to point at the cross, we're supposed to proclaim the truth of the gospel and tell people why we believe what we believe. And we pray that you would give the increase there, that you would change hearts with your grace, and that when we, we speak the truth and we share the gospel with the people in our lives, 
they would respond with faith and repentance because you're doing a work in their hearts. Right? That you would bless that and that you would guide us in the way that we would do that. You bless the way that we would study your word today and that whatever we do, it might always be in your will. Father, we praise you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew 24, beginning in verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn, turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise, and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. It's heavy, right? He's telling us something important we're supposed to see here. He wants us to understand these things. Yet we see all these different people telling us that these things mean different things. So we look out and we see all these different teachers and preachers and, and people that are claiming that, well, this is what this means, but they're telling us different things. And we say, how is it that we're supposed to understand which one of these people is telling the truth? We're supposed to let the Holy Spirit guide us as we study God's word. We're supposed to see these things through the lens of a born again Christian and say, my brain isn't smart enough to figure this out on my own. Any understanding I have of what Jesus said here is, has been revealed by God himself. God has given me an understanding of this thing, and I'm going to compare Scripture with Scripture to make all of this have context. So as we read it, we look at it in that context of, well, I can only understand it if God's given me that understanding. Last week, we started this chapter and saw how Jesus answered the disciples when they asked him about the destruction of the temple and how that relates when the, the temple gets destroyed, the desolation of their house, how that relates to his return. They ask him in the way that they ask him because he had just told these religious leaders in the temple courtyard that their house was going to be made desolate. There's a prophecy about, that's a prophecy about the temple being destroyed, but it also points to this false religious system in Israel that was going to be torn down too. So the temple's coming down, but that false religion that teaches a man-centered doctrine that, that says it's about these religious leaders and a certain group of people and not about the Lord God himself, that's coming down too. There won't be any of that that won't be overturned as well. These disciples heard what Jesus said to those religious leaders in the courtyard. And they're standing outside of this amazing temple. And they're looking at the most beautiful building that they've ever seen in their life. It's gorgeous. It's huge. It's like a fortress. And they look at it and they wonder, how could this desolation that Jesus is talking about possibly happen? This place looks like no one could destroy it. It's huge. It looks untouchable. How could something like this ever become desolate? So these guys are disciples of Christ. And when they hear Jesus say that he's going to return, they believe him. They're like, yes, I believe that. Because when Jesus says something, they believe it. But they couldn't see the whole picture yet. They didn't see everything, this, this, this larger image that he was, he was pointing at to them to say, this is what's going to happen and why. They could see pieces of it, but they didn't have context yet. Because this is before the cross. This is before the resurrection. And at this point, they're misunderstanding these really basic essential details that Jesus has been pointing at. But soon after this, after he resurrects after the cross, they will see it. They just don't see it yet. At the beginning of this chapter, we saw them come to Jesus in private. And they ask him to explain these things to him. They're asking for context. They're thinking that the Messiah is going to come back soon. And when he gets here, he's going to destroy that temple. 
So they're misunderstanding the timing of these things and exactly how this is going to play out. And we see that again in Acts chapter 1 when they talk about how his, is this the time when you're going to go out and you're going to do these things that we're expecting you to do. And he says, not yet. I'm, I'm telling you to go out and do these other things first. So they don't understand exactly this chain of events as he's showing it to us in Scripture. And he's going to explain these things in the way he answers them in the rest of this chapter. So in that line of reasoning, these disciples asked Jesus to clarify what he said in the temple earlier. By the way that Jesus answers them, though, it reveals so much more than what these guys were asking. He's telling them a much bigger context. Uh, their, you know, their question is this big, and his answer is this big. And he's saying, you have to understand this to understand the context of this. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to reveal this to you. But it's a lot bigger than you realize. It's a lot more important than what you think. And he shows us a clear picture of the events that we're told to look for that are signs of his return by the way that he answers them here. These are things that happen before Jesus returns. And it's important that we realize that. He tells us these things in order and the way that he does for a reason. He says, these things must happen. These are scary things. They must happen. And then he says, don't be frightened. I'm going to tell you this horrible, scary, terrible, ominous thing. Don't be scared. Why wouldn't I be scared knowing these things, these famines and these wars? These people that are claiming they're Christ, the persecution and the death of his people. We're his people. Why wouldn't that be scary to me? Because we trust the Lord God in these things. And we see what he says here, as scary as they look, and we say, all right. God said, I use all things for the good of those who love me, who are called according to my purpose. I trust God when he says that. I believe him when he says that. So even though I see these things, I say, okay, I trust the Lord in this. And I know he's going to use this for the reasons that he told me. We read it in our Bible and we say yes to it. We're like, yes. When a mother goes into labor, it's a sign that there's soon going to be a birth. And those birth pains are a way of knowing that the labor is coming soon. And Jesus calls these events birth pains. He's telling us that these things like, are like contractions that lead to this beautiful event that everybody's waiting for. This thing, this beautiful thing, this new birth that we get to be part of. Birth pains will increase in frequency and intensity after labor starts until the baby is finally born. And that is a beautiful illustration of what's happening in all of God's creation. You think about the world and the way that God has made it. And as the return of Christ gets closer, those contractions, these events that he tells us to look for here, get more frequent and more intense until finally the birth happens, this new birth that he talks about. And we see that and we go, oh, that's a beautiful picture. That, I, I get that, what you're saying here. These proverbial birth pains that Jesus tells us to look for are people coming in Jesus' name and saying, I am the Messiah. They're not saying they're Jesus. They're coming in the name of God and saying, oh, no, not him, me. False teachers teaching a false gospel. We see that a lot. There's a lot of people out there teaching something different than what Jesus has, has, has given us in the good news. We know that it's about what God does and not what we do. But there's plenty of people that tell you it's about you and not about him. We hear about wars and rumors of wars, nations and kingdoms rising up against each other, famines and earthquakes and plagues, Christians being delivered into tribulation, being killed and hated for their faith, and the way that those false Christians will respond to these things that he's saying here, these birth pains, these contractions, will be to walk away from the faith that they claim to believe, but they never really had and never took root in their heart. True faith endures because Jesus gives us eternal life. No one takes it away. Once he saves you, you are forever saved. And he grows you. You're not going to be perfect at that point, but he's going to grow you progressively, sanctify you into the person he's called you to be. But superficial faith, people that claim that they believe because it feels good. When affliction or persecution comes, you can see what they've truly put their faith in by the way that they fall away because of how they've responded to these hard times, especially when those hard times are something that happens because of what your faith is in. When you say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, I know that he's God. I know that there's only one way to know God, and that's through the Son. 
When you say that and they hate you for it, or they're willing to kill you for it, they persecute you or hurt you for it. When, the, when, when it's your faith that's the reason that they're, they're coming at you in the way that they do. That's when those people who have a superficial faith fall away because they don't think it's worth it. We double down. We meet those challenges by saying, I don't care what you do. I know that God's going to use whatever hardship that's happening for my good. I know that God has a purpose for all these things. I get to be part of what he's doing here. But I'm going to meet that challenge by saying the truth. I'm going to proclaim the gospel and share my hope no matter what happens. All these things that Jesus tells us to look for, these birth pains, have been happening on earth all along. Since the very beginning. But the Bible, as well as history, as we look back and we see these things playing out through history, tell us that these things, these birth pains, are going to increase both in intensity and frequency as we get closer to the return of Christ. So it's nothing new. It's just more of it. It's more intense as we go. And these things are going to continue to increase until the very end. And at some point, these things are going to come to a crescendo. They will peak. They will come to this point that's going to look like what Jesus is pointing at here. And during that final generation, right before Christ returns, these birth pain events will have a greater intensity than ever before in history. There will be more wars, more famine. There will be more persecution of God's people than there ever has been in history. It's going to build and build and build until we see it in the way that Jesus is explaining it here, even though it's been happening to a lesser degree all throughout history since the beginning. Verses 13 and 14 are really important for the way that we understand what he's saying. Jesus says, the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. The one who endures are Christians. That's you. You'll be able to see their faith. You'll see it by how they respond to these events that Jesus is describing here. If they're hated and persecuted and killed because of their faith, and this causes them to draw closer to the Lord, then those are the people who Jesus is saying will endure. These are his elect that he's talking about. No matter how bad it gets, they double down. They look right at it and they say, this is what I believe and why I believe it. Jesus goes on to say in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So while people are hating Christians and killing them and persecuting them because of their faith, these people that Jesus is talking about in verse 14 continue to share the truth of the gospel. No matter if they're killing them, they're killing the people around them, they're destroying their church, they're burning their house down, they're firing from their job, they're starving them out, they're, they're hating them because of their faith. These are people that continue to share their faith no matter what the consequences are. These are people who endure through these tribulations and these hardships. They're people who are facing death because of what they believe. And what do they do? They share the gospel. They preach the gospel. And they share their faith no matter how hard it gets. Knowing that they could be killed for what they believe. Can you imagine? They're burning houses down. They're, bur they're blowing up churches. They're killing Christians. They're freezing your bank account. They're firing people from their jobs. They're saying, if you are one of these followers of Christ, I hate you. I want to kill you. I'm going to hurt you. And you say, this is what I believe and why I believe it. I won't pretend I don't believe it. I won't turn from that. I'm going to endure through this knowing that I get to be one of these people that God's talking about here. It's amazing when you think about the mentality and, and, and the true faith of the people that get to live through this time. It might be our generation. It might be the one after us or the one after them. It might be way down the road. But all we know is the people he's describing here, no matter how hard it gets, those people have true faith, meet that challenge by proclaiming the truth of the gospel. And the way that they do that is a testimony to all the world about the truth of the gospel. They are the testimony that go out and preach the gospel despite how hard this gets. Jesus says it's a testimony to all the nations. These Christians that are going through these things, they do not cower in fear. You ever seen somebody who doesn't want to share their faith with other people because they don't want to offend them? Ah, you know what? They believe differently. I'm going to keep it to myself. These aren't those people. These are people that are going to tell you what they believe and why they believe it. And when persecution comes, they don't keep it to themselves. They preach the gospel. They say, this is why I believe what I do. And they share this hope that's in their hearts. And their lives are a testimony that the world sees. And you can see their faith. You see it by how they respond to hardship. And they endure. Jesus says, and then, after all these things, 
after they respond to that hardship by, by proclaiming the gospel, even when their lives are on the line, they know they can be killed for it. After all of this, Jesus says, and then the end will come. Those were the birth pains. After that, the end comes. The great tribulation that Jesus is describing here. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. That's a key phrase there, isn't it? God wants you to understand what he's saying here. The apostle Matthew, who wrote this down, the Holy Spirit moved him, and he wrote this down for us, those later generations of disciples, to read these things. We're supposed to read this and understand these things. And you think about all these different views of what this means, and you say, why don't we all agree on what this says? Doesn't it just say what it means? Why is there such an argument over what these things mean that Jesus said here in Matthew 24? Matthew's saying, let the reader understand. We're supposed to look at this and go, I should understand this. The abomination of desolation that Jesus is talking about here is a prophecy that the Lord gave us through the prophet Daniel back in the book of Daniel. It was around 560 years before Jesus quotes it here in Matthew 24. Remember last week, we talked about this concept of types and shadows, where it'll be like a, a real historical event or people or places in Scripture. A real thing that points forward to these bigger spiritual concepts. And these historical events help us, as we read our Bibles, understand these bigger spiritual concepts by the way that we look at these real life, spirit, these real life historical events and people and places. They act as a, a kind of illustration that helps us to look at it and conceptualize these spiritual things. So it's a real thing that happened, and it points to a much bigger concept. And the way that we see this helps us understand this other thing. It's types and shadows is what we call that. And these types and shadows give us an understanding of what God is saying in his word here. And it shows us how God reveals himself to his creation that we're part of. So we apply that concept of type and shadows to the abomination of desolation that Jesus is talking about here in verse 15. Daniel prophesied about the abomination of desolation, and Jesus tells us how that prophecy unfolds by the way he puts it in context of his return and the things that lead up to Jesus coming back. Some people look at the abomination of desolation, and they think that it's about the desecration of the temple that this guy named Antiochus Epiphanes did in the second century BC. Now, Epiphanes was the king of Syria at the time, and he invaded Jerusalem and went into the temple and took the altar that we read about in those early books in the Old Testament. He took that altar and he turned it into a shrine for Zeus. Think about that for a second. That's a bad idea. He took the temple the, where people worship the Lord God and worshiped a pagan god there and took the actual altar and made it into a shrine for a false god, a pagan god. And not only that, he sacrificed pigs on it. Well, to the Jews, pigs were unclean because that's what it says in the law. This guy invades Jerusalem, worships a false pagan god in the temple of the one true god, and he sacrifices an unclean animal on that altar that he's using to worship a pagan god on. Well, that's definitely an abomination. An abomination of desolation is the way that the prophet Daniel talks about this. Well, that's a real historical event. That really happened. And it points forward to this bigger spiritual truth that we're going to see unfold later that Jesus is talking about here. So the type, the real historical event, real people, that points to the bigger concept down the road. Again, in 70 AD, when Rome invaded Jerusalem not long, a few decades after the cross, Titus invades Jerusalem and destroys the temple. He, it, he, it's a, a big massacre. Thousands of people die. And when Jesus is talking about not leaving, the, your house is going to be made desolate, it's unfolding. It's fulfilling part of the prophecy in the way that Titus invades Jerusalem here. And we see that house uh, of Israel, the religious house, the temple, but also this religion being made desolate in the way that he does that. And there's people who think that that is the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. So here's two examples that both point forward to what Jesus is talking about here. But the religious leaders, the religious system in Jerusalem wasn't fully destroyed even though the temple was. So 
it wasn't all the way fulfilled and it wasn't the completion of that prophecy, but it does point forward to what that prophecy is about. And that's about the coming of Christ and what happens before he gets here. Jesus was clearly looking toward a future abomination of desolation of man. He was talking about a much, much bigger spiritual thing that's going to be the culmination, the crescendo of all these birth pains that's going to happen, that we're going to see happen if we're in that generation before Christ returns. And these historical events at the temple point forward to that bigger spiritual thing. They're real events, but God uses them as an illustration. And the way that we see them helps us to understand that bigger thing in a way that we can see it because we understand these smaller things that point forward to it. That's the type and the shadows unfolding themselves. 2 Thessalonians 2 is the key chapter in the New Testament that proves that the rapture happens after all these things that Jesus says here. Paul says, let no one in any way deceive you. Well, that's the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew 24. For it, talking about the rapture, it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That's the many that fall away that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24, 10. So these are parallel passages. Paul's saying it in 2 Thessalonians 2, and Jesus is saying it here in Matthew 24. It's in multiple other places too, but Paul is the key place that we look to that helps explain these little details, and it helps give more context to what Jesus is saying here. Paul says, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. The man of lawlessness is the Antichrist that Jesus is saying comes and claims is he is the Christ, but he's not. He lies about it. He's pretending to be the Christ. And Jesus just told us people will come in the name of God and say, I am the Christ. And Paul says that's the man of lawlessness who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being the God. He calls himself God. Well, that is the abomination of desolation that Jesus is talking about here. When this man, this antichrist, comes into the temple and says, I am God. I exalt myself above all things. That's what the abomination of desolation actually is. That's the real context of this thing. And that's what Jesus is warning us about in our scripture here today. He's not just telling you details to look for before he gets here. He's warning you as his people, hey, when these things happen, you need to understand what they are. Don't be misled. Don't get fooled by people that tell you something different. Read this and understand that you're supposed to understand it. You're supposed to have an understanding of this thing so you won't be fooled. Because there will people be people who will teach you something contrary to what he said here. And that's what he's talking about. When the Apostle Paul describes the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist comes into the temple and proclaims that he's God, he lies and says that he's God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he's describing it as something that happens in the future. It's not something that happens in the past. It's something that's going to happen. It's a prophecy that happens at the end of the age, right before Jesus Christ returns. And Christ's words here look past those historical events that we were talking about before, where they come in and they destroy the temple, or they, they worship a false god in the temple. It, it looks way past that. These are types and shadows of this much bigger thing that Jesus is telling us about here. So in verse 15, when, you, when Jesus says, When you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, he's saying, When you, you being Christians, see the Antichrist standing in the temple, you'll know that Christ's return will come soon after this. This will happen, and then Jesus will come back. And we know that Jesus is coming back. He tells us he's coming back, and we believe him. And that's something you've been told to watch for, these events that tell you the sign of the times. But wait, didn't Jesus say that the temple would be destroyed? Yes. Was the, was the temple destroyed by Rome in 70 A.D.? He said, not one stone will be left upon another. It will be made desolate. That happened, right? Yes. There's no temple there right now. The temple is gone. And for the Antichrist to stand in the temple and call himself God, that means that at some point, someone has to rebuild that temple. <coughs> it's been rebuilt twice before. And it's going to happen again at some point. And Christ won't return until after the temple gets rebuilt. So it shows us this thing's going to happen first before Christ returns. In verse 15, 
Jesus says, let the reader understand. You're supposed to understand this. He wants you to understand what he's saying here. It's supposed to make sense to us. So if you have any questions about this, please come and talk with me after service or at any time that you feel the urge to, to, to know more about these things. We should be talking about them and trying to understand what he says here. But that understanding that we've been given is revealed to us from the Lord God himself. It's not something that we figure out on our own. It's something that as we study our, our, our Bibles and we pray together, God gives us an understanding of these things. And we should be talking about these things together. When this event with the abomination of desolation happens, when the Antichrist stands in the temple and he proclaims himself to be God, when he lies about that, verse 16 says, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. He's talking about God's people in Judea. He's not saying everyone in Judea, everyone in Jerusalem, everybody just run to the mountains. That's not what he's saying here. He's not talking about those who don't have faith. He's talking about his people, his remnant of Christians, those spirit-filled new creatures in Christ, whether you're Jew or Gentile. If you're in Judea, he's talking about those people here that are being killed and persecuted and hated because of their faith. Those people who are in Jerusalem, in Judea, when that happens, those people should run for the mountains. He says they should flee. They should escape if they can. Because things are about to escalate very quickly after the abomination of desolation. Because that event changes everything in the whole world. That one event is our sign that we look for and we say, oh, here it comes. This is what Jesus is talking about that happens right before the, abom right before the great tribulation. This thing changes all of it. And we should respond to it by doing what Jesus says to do here. And the mountains that he's saying to go hide in, to go flee to, are likely the same ones that David hid from King Saul from in 1 Samuel. Jesus continues in verse 17. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. He's using these examples to tell us about how urgent it is to escape this place. If you're in Judea, get out as soon as you see this happen. It's a warning to his people. He's saying, drop what you're doing and run. The reason, he says, to pray that it doesn't happen in the winter or on the Sabbath is because those things are going to slow you down. And he wants you to get out of there quickly. To this day, there's neighborhoods in Israel that come to pretty much a standstill. Everything stops. There's no traffic. All kinds of things just, just stop where they are. And everyone rests on the Sabbath. And if you're in Judea on the Sabbath, when this event happens, you're going to have a tough time getting out of town fast. It's going to slow you down. In verse 21, For then, then being after the abomination of desolation in the temple, there will be a great tribulation. Such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Even with all these events, all these birth pains that he's describing in the verses before this, this is where things get really bad. This is where they get especially terrible. After the abomination of desolation event, then the great tribulation begins. The word such as has not occurred and nor ever will along with the description that happens in the verse after this, show us that these things happen in the future. So verse 22 says, Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Who are the elect? The elect is talking about Christians. These are God's people. There, there's something special about these elect but for their sake, he would cut these days short. Those, these are those people who are being killed and persecuted and hated for their faith in Christ. Those are the elect. For the sake of those saved Christians, those elect, those days that Jesus say will be the worst days in history, the worst trouble in history, those days will be cut short. We read these things and it's ominous. It's scary. And we think, I would avoid this if I could. I don't want to live through these things if I can help it. And that concept of being raptured out before these events that you hear about so often, that sounds preferable. You're like, yeah, if I could choose, I'll, I'll, I'll gratefully 
be raptured out before these things get bad. They're going to kill and persecute and hate God's people because of their faith. You don't want that. You don't want to live through that, right? It's no wonder people want to, want, when they hear it, they like it. They want that to be true. No one wants to live through a time that God, that the Lord God, the, the Messiah, says is the hardest part of history. Especially when it's your faith that is causing the world to hate you. Oh, you're a Christian? Oh, you follow Christ? Well, that's why I hate you. That's why I'm going to persecute you. That's why I'm going to try and kill you. We look at that and we go, why would I want to live through that? Not only is this the hardest time in all of history to live through, but it's faith in Christ that makes it so dangerous for the people that are being killed. But there's a special place that God's people have in this event where we get to go through it. And for a born-again Christian to look at these things that the Bible is talking about here, to look at what Jesus is telling us is going to happen at some point in history and say, I trust the Lord God in this. Or even this is something that God will use for the good of those who love him. When we look at it and we say, I believe that God is going to use this for good. I assume this hard thing, this terrible thing that I see coming is going to be a blessing in the way that I understand it. It says something about what our faith looks like. Hard times and affliction causes a spirit-filled Christian to draw near to the Lord. And Jesus says, there's never going to be a time as hard as this. And that is going to be something that God's going to use to draw us close to him. And the people who live in this time are going to draw very close to him because of how hard it's going to be. Verses 23 and 24. Then, if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Even those actual, true faith, spirit-filled Christians, those, those born-again, new creatures in Christ, even those people, they're trying to fool. They're not just trying to, to fool the, the unsaved. They're trying to fool God's people here into believing that they were wrong. And so Jesus tells us beforehand, this is what it's going to look like. So you won't be fooled. There will be fake teachers and people proclaiming that they're Christ. At this point, the Antichrist is going to be claiming that he's God. He's going to be going in the temple, saying that he's God, and all these crazy things are going to happen after that. And he'll be lying to the world and calling himself God, standing in that temple in Jerusalem, doing what Jesus called great signs and wonders. He's going to be doing things that are going to fool people. They're, they're, he's going to trick them, and, and they're going to misunderstand what these things are. And there are people who are going to believe. A majority of people will believe but not Christians, not the elect, not those who had their hearts changed by God's grace. Jesus is saying that those signs and wonders will mislead people, but they will not fool the elect. God's people will know. We'll see these things happen and we'll go, I get that. I see what that is. You're not fooling me. Does that make sense? Everyone else is going to go, wow, this looks legitimate. And we're going to go, don't get fooled. Look what Jesus actually said in his word here. And it's only those false teachers and the people that follow them that are going to be pointing to this and reading it out of order and trying to explain away so many of these things that are going to go out and say, oh no, you guys are wrong. This must be the truth here. And we're going to go, what did Jesus say? Let's just believe that. Let's just do that. He told us this for a reason. He told us these things in this order for a reason. In John 10, verses 4 and 5, Jesus says, when he puts forth all his own, talking about Christians, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep, that's the elect, Follow him because they know his voice. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, right? A stranger, they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. So when God's people see the Antichrist claiming that he's God in the temple, we will flee from him. We will see through his lies and we will know who he is because we're not going to be fooled. We know God's voice. We know Christ's voice. And we follow him because he's the truth. He is the way. He's the life. This other guy who's claiming that he's the Messiah, we're going to see right through that if we're his sheep. If we're not his sheep, we'll be fooled by that. Verses 25 and 26. Behold, I have told you in advance. He did it for a reason. So if they, the false teachers and fake Christians, they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. 
He told us in advance so that we won't be fooled. We won't believe them. No one should believe these people that claim that Jesus comes in secret, that the Messiah is there in secret. So on one hand, you have people who say, this is the Christ, not Jesus, this other person, this false Christ, this antichrist. And on the other hand, you have Christians who have been fooled, who think Jesus comes in secret. And there's these two different groups of people who have both been fooled because the Bible tells us very specifically that every eye will see Jesus when he returns. He's not coming in secret. So he says, when they tell you that, behold, he's out there in the wilderness. Let's go see him. Not everybody saw him. Just you get to go see him. Don't believe them. When they say, no, he's in the inner rooms. He's in this place. Don't believe them. Don't go. Because when Christ returns, all of us will see him. The whole world sees Christ. No one's going to miss it when he returns. He's going to return the same way that he left in Acts chapter 1 in the clouds. And it won't be a secret thing. The world's going to see it. And when they see it, everything changes. You're waiting for it. You're watching for it. The world will be caught like a thief in the night when he comes back. Suddenly he's upon them. But for us who are looking at these signs, this progression of events that are happening before Christ returns, it's not going to surprise us. We're going to, the anticipation is going to build. It's going to be more and more exciting. As hard as it gets, and it's going to get harder and harder and harder until he comes back in the clouds. But every step of the way, as it gets harder, we get more excited. We have more anticipation, knowing that he's coming. Knowing that he uses these things, that they're a gift that he gives us that sanctifies us. That we get to be a testimony for the world. And they look at us and they say, these are his people. We get to be his people if that's the generation that we're living in. Whoever these people are, those Christians have a special role to play in all of creation. Because their lives and how hard they're going to be point to Christ. And they show the world this is what the truth is. Verse 27 and 28 say, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. He's saying, I will be there in the sky and you will see me. If you're in this generation, you will see Christ return. It's not going to be a secret thing. He's telling his people, do not believe the lies of false teachers that say Christ's return will be a secret. Think about every pastor, preacher, and teacher. Every book or movie or person that you've ever heard talk about a secret return of Christ. It's going to be the, the, this. It'll happen fast, but it'll be quiet. And it'll be secret and no one's going to see it. A secret rapture where God's people will be taken out before all these birth things, before all these things that Jesus tells us we're going to live through in Matthew 24. A great majority of modern churches say, you don't have to worry about that. That's not for you. Even though Jesus tells us specifically, this is for us. These are people who are persecuted because of their faith. People teach. There's movies, left behind movies. People on television and internet ministries. People that think, oh no, you don't have to go through that. Every other generation in history has these tribulations, but not you. If you're in that generation, when Christ returns, he'll take you out of the way. You won't have to deal with these things. And you know what? When he does that, no one else is going to see it. It's going to be a secret. That's not true. That's not what he says here. Jesus says when he comes back, everyone sees him. He take, these people teach that when he comes back, no one sees him. That's the opposite of what Jesus is saying here. They think he comes back and takes his church away before these events that we're reading about, even though Jesus says you will, if you're in this generation, have to live through these things. People say things like, oh, well, he comes back secretly, but his feet don't touch the ground and no one sees him. So that doesn't count. What? That's not at all what he says here. That's ridiculous to think that Christ comes secretly. When he says, I'm going to come back exactly how I left. Just angels in Acts 1 say he'll return the same way that he left. And all eyes will see him. And there's people, a majority of people, that tell you, no, nah, it's a secret. So Jesus is saying, don't believe them. When they say it's a secret and he's returned over here, don't go there. Don't believe that. Revelation 1-7 says, behold. He is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him. He doesn't mince his words. He means it when he says it. When Christ returns, we will all see him, whether you're a believer or not. Whether you understand what he's saying here or not, you will see him return if you're in that generation that's there when he returns. 
Jesus says his return will be as public and unmistakable as a blast of lightning across the sky. We'll all see it happen when he's here. Everyone's going to see it. Everyone's going to know. And when someone tries to say that he returns secretly, his people, his elect, will know that that's not right. These people are lying. They might be misinformed. They might misunderstand. They might be taught wrong or they might be lying on purpose. But whatever it is, Christ says, I'm coming back. And we know he is. And when he does, we're all going to see it. It's not going to be a secret. Jesus says, don't let anyone mislead you. This is what's going to happen. I told you ahead of time so that you would know. You being his people, his church, his disciples, his remnant people, his elect. They get to be here when these things happen. I told you these things ahead of time so that you would know and not be misled. Jesus tells us these things for a reason. And we're supposed to see these things for what they are. It doesn't matter what religious leaders or preachers, people on television, these books, these theologians, these professors in school. It doesn't matter what they think it is. What did Jesus say here in Matthew 24? What did he tell us to look out for and to understand what he's saying? He said, I told you so that you would know. We're supposed to see these things as they really are. And when persecution or affliction comes, and it will, we're supposed to trust God in these things and draw near to the Lord. That's how you can see your faith. That's how you can test your faith. When things get hard, whether it's now or when things get really bad, the way that you respond to adversity shows you what it is you put your faith in. It shows you the state of your heart by the way that you respond and trust the Lord God in whatever happens. If you have any questions about today's message, come and see me after service and we'll go deeper into the text and we'll see what the Bible says about these things. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for the way you've changed our hearts. We thank you for your grace, for your great mercy. We thank you for the patient way that you love us. We thank you for the way you sanctify us and grow us into the people you want us to be. We pray that as our faith and our understanding grows, that we might get more and more excited and bold in the way that we share this hope that you've given us with the people that we get to speak to. We pray that you would make us capable of serving you in that way. We struggle looking out at these people in our lives, our, our family and our friends, and the people in, in this world that don't know you and our heart breaks for them. We, we want so much to be effective in the way that we share our faith, to, to see them receive this gift that you've given us that we do not deserve. We pray that you would help us to be patient, that as we proclaim the truth, that we would understand that it's you who gives the increase there, that it's your grace that saves us. It's no amount of of, of special words and eloquent things that we might say. No amount of, of trying to show them how much we know our Bibles can convince them of the truth unless your grace has changed our hearts and that they could hear the truth when we speak it. But we pray that we might proclaim the truth bold and that we might speak it in spirit and truth, that we might live our lives in such a way that we're a testimony for who you are and that those who you've saved, their, their hearts might be changed by your grace, that they would respond to the truth with faith and repentance. We pray for opportunities to go out and to share our faith in that way. Father, please bless our families. Please bless our church. Please bless the food we're about to eat. And whatever it is that you've called us to do, we pray that we might do all these things in a way that it would please you and that you would be glorified in every moment of these lives that you've given us. Father, we praise you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.